Hello everyone, we're live with another webinar of Liga Mart. Uh, I am Federico Vasoli, originally qualified in Italy, in Milan. I'm a lawyer and I run my own firm called the MTV Globo in uh, Singapore, Vietnam, where I'm uh, uh, recording this webinar and Malta. Today we have Bunmi Genfa with us, uh, who has an incredible personal story that I would like her to tell us uh, in person, I, I would probably distort and, and not make justice to her incredible journey. So welcome, Bunmi. Um, let's jump straight into the uh, show. And uh, first of all, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for joining Liga Mart's uh, webinar. Uh, tell us about yourself, because I was so fascinated when we first talked uh, that I, I'm sure that our audience would be equally fascinated. Thank you so much, Federico and Legal Mark, for this, for having me. Um, so, yes, like you rightly said, I have a very interesting journey into how I got into fashion law. Um, I am London based um, for everyone, you know, tuning, tuning in. But in terms of how I got into fashion law is I actually never knew fashion law was an actual legal area. Um, I currently work as a conflicts analyst um, within risk and compliance for a magic circle law firm. So already you can see, you know, there is no direct link between the two. But if I take it back to when I decided, you know, that I wanted a legal career, actually, I decided that I wanted to be a family law barrister. Um, it was very much ingrained in me. Um, and that's what I definitely worked towards. So I did my three years. Um, undergraduate law degree and then I went off the bar school to do my bar course and master's at the bar part-time whilst working full-time at a barrister's uh, chambers um, when that was completed in 2021 um, late 2021 and that's when I kind of decided actually I want to switch gears no longer wanted to pursue a career in um, as a bar barrister but I wanted to go into law firm risk and compliance so you know here I am in law firm risk and compliance and absolutely loving it but in terms of fashion law and where that entered into my legal journey, that came about when I was in my second year of my law degree. So back in 2016. Um, and I had always had an obviously interest in, you know, the legal industry, legal profession, wanted to have a career in, in it, but also actually had an interest you know, in fashion. But I actually had no fashion, you know, experience or background. I was just a straight law student, very traditional. Um, and it wasn't until I went to a fashion event um, back in 2016. And during the networking phase, um, I spoke with the um, organisers of the fashion event. And they were telling me, you know, that I could get into fashion law, basically. Um, you know, it's a legal area and I should definitely go home and do some research. So, of course, I went home, did some research and rightly so. It was a fashion, it was a legal area, very, very small um, legal niche area in law. Um, but what I did find out was, unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of UK centred resources or websites or there was only a handful of UK law firms um, back then that were doing anything to do with fashion law. So a lot of the things that I came across were very US centred. So you had, you, you know, the notorious fashion law website. Um, created by Julie Zerbo, for example, that was my point of reference. Um, you had the business of fashion as well. Um, so very, very little things that, you know, really helped me on my journey. Um, but it was at that point that I saw, you know, a gap in the market and I thought, right, there's not anything really in terms of the UK point of view. Why don't I start a fashion law blog? Um, so I got the name, I hosted the website on Squarespace, and I just started from there. Um, initially, it was called back then, uh, called the Fashion Law Chronicles, for those, you know, who, you know, are aware of what I was doing from the very beginning. Um, so, yeah, started with the website and started blogging. And from then on, within the first couple of months of starting, things got very, very quickly recognized so I soon had you know volunteers writing for the site um, which was amazing so volunteers from Australia, New York, um, New Zealand, Canada for example um, you know quickly grew a lot of attraction um, and then from then on I went uh, back to my university I entered into um, the entrepreneurial competition um, and I was a runner-up of 500 pounds which I put towards you know just the running costs um, of running the website you know I was a student back then so a lot of things were powered through my own um, money um, but again that was amazing and an amazing achievement for me um, then I went on to go on to the UK blog awards 2017 where I was actually a finalist um, for best company uh, lifestyle blog 
Um, and again, that was a massive achievement in such a small amount of time. Um, so things really moved up for me in the terms of, you know, my introduction into the fashion law world. Um, and it was then that I had the encouragement to team up with a UK law firm and do my first ever event um, based on the sustainability within the fashion industry. Um, and that was held at Condé Nast College of Fashion back in 2017. An amazing event. Um, we had panels from lawyers, industry professionals, um, just really talking about, you know, sustainability in the fashion industry, you know, from a legal perspective, but also from an industry perspective as, as well. Um, fast forward to 2021, um, I had decided to take a hiatus um, because of my bar study. So I came back in 2021 with a new name called the Fashion Law Edit. And that's when I did my second event, um, which was an online webinar called Women in um, Fashion Law, which was a ce in celebration of International Women's Day. Um, and because we were obviously in lockdown, I decided to do you know, a webinar on that. And it was just a panel of UK and US lawyers, female lawyers, um, really sharing their career journeys, how they got into fashion law, um, you know, what do students or anyone who was interested in fashion or what they could be doing and also talking about the industry itself from a legal um, perspective in terms of what was happening um, in terms of the legal side, you know, Brexit um, and especially for those who were um, located in the UK, I think it was a really good moment for us to have the US talk from their side point of view as well in terms of, you know, how fashion law is for us, uh, for them, but also for us and how we can enter into it. Um, and then fast forward from that, from last year, I had my most recent and third event, which was, again, an in-person in panel event um, focused on this time influencers and content creators. So um, it was called Legally um, Influenced 101. And it was just about, you know, helping influencers and content creators learn about their legalities since they're, they themselves are in a business of their own. You know, what should they look up for in a contract? How, they, how can they negotiate um, with you know these big brands and companies um, if they do get into a bit of trouble what point of contact do they need to go through um, you know dispute resolution um, so it really brought it back to basics um, for them just to be able to understand and I think it was at that moment I kind of decided like there's a lot of demand um, over the years that I've been doing this there's been a lot of demands um, I've got a lot of emails and direct messages in terms of you know did I do work experience or internships um, and obviously you know when I first started this was just a side hobby you know I didn't expect it to grow um, and it's from that point of view that I kind of decided I think it's time to turn the blog into an actual legal and business consultancy um, so bit by bit with my new co-founders um, that's what was slowly turning the blog into um, a legal and business consultancy. Wonderful uh, thank you for this broad presentation Bunmi there is a lot a lot a lot to discuss um, and I already have some uh, something in mind but before we continue uh, you mentioned the blog you mentioned the website can you remind our listeners and our viewers what the uh, address and name of the uh, website is yeah so we've gone through a bit of a rebrand three times so the official name um because we're now expanding not just to fashion but also entertainment is called the law of fe so it's www.thelawoffe.com um so fe is literally f for foxtrot e for elephant um so you can find us on you know different socials instagram twitter and obviously our website as well that's that. That's wonderful. You also recently won an important award, right? Can you can you tell yeah. us something about it? So I won the Unsung Hero 2000, uh, 2023 award earlier this year um, in collaboration with uh, Women and Law Women in Women and Diversity in Law Awards, um, which was an awards show in the UK um, hosted early on this year, just in recognition of you know my legal contributions, especially within you know the fashion law um, sphere as well, and you know how I'm just trying to champion that one and help people within the legal industry, you know just help them in terms of their career journey within fashion law as well. Congratulations. Thank and uh, also to respond to a comment that I'm reading here live in our, in our comments chat, can you tell us more about what fashion law is? Uh, and let me, let me anticipate the answer by, by uh, giving a comment. Um, yeah. That is, I, I come from a country, Italy, where fashion is evidently uh, quite famous and it represents one of the strengths um, yeah. of the country itself. So uh, in where I come from, fashion law uh, emerged a while ago as an area of practice, but it is also something that would be common sense. 
contrary to, um, for instance, compliance or antitrust. Uh, Italy, yeah. interestingly enough, didn't have an antitrust legislation until 1992, which is some hundred years after the Sherman Act of the US and, and definitely later than, than the UK and many other major countries. So it is interesting to see how uh, one's culture, one's uh, uh, geopolitical events and, and major factor shaping the, the, the culture, again, sorry for repeating this word, of, of, uh, of a country, of a nation, has an influence on what an area of practice of the law uh, is. But back to you, Bunmi, how would you define fashion law and what do you exactly do in your uh, practice with the law of FE? Um, if I just want to say quickly, side, so I'm going to have to switch off my camera because the internet connection is... In don't, worry. Um, don't worry. Don't worry, don't worry. But in terms of fashion law, so... I think for me, if I take it back to when I first started fashion law, there wasn't actually a legal definition. I mean, mm -hmm. currently, it's, there isn't like some sort of statute that you can go to and you can get that definition. Um, but the way I look at fashion law is it's a broad umbrella of different other areas of um, legal um, areas, for example. So there's so many definitions. But the way I interpret it is, you know, it's typically legal issues faced by you know fashion designers or fashion brands um where you know it incorporates different concepts from you know ip ip protection um transaction employment licensing corporate responsibility sustainability um there's a whole that it's just amalgamated with different mini areas of law that you know to actually pinpoint a definition you can't really do that i think Absolutely. the best way for me, um, in terms of when I was doing my research in terms of what is fashion law, I came across um, Susan Scafidi, um, who, you know, is regarded as, you know, the pioneer of fashion law from as early as I think 2013, 14. Um, and I remember she did a, I think it was a business of fashion interview back then. Um, and the way that she defined it was, you know, she thought about the questions that the, de the designers um, had and all of the illegal issues that may arise through, you know, the life of a garment or the designer's original idea to the consumer's closet. And, you know, from then on, that popped up, you know, things to do with intellectual property, business and finance, um, things to do with, like I said, with employment, you know, international trade. So I think it's really looking at things from what are the issues that these fashion brands and fashion designers are having? Yeah. And then from then on, that's where you get the definitions. Absolutely. Um, it, is, it is absolutely what I have witnessed uh, working partly also in this area um, in, in Italy. So even if uh, the term fashion law may at the time have not been particularly um, familiar uh, for, uh, for, for somebody living in England, um, definitely the, the definition that you gave is something that I would see as the exact same definition that I would give when it comes to uh, fashion law in Italy. So um, your clients, or in general, clients of lawyers like you that are specialized in fashion law are generally brands, uh, designers, people that work in the fashion industry, or also entertainment business, since you have expanded into that domain yeah. as well. Right. Um, okay. So... Um, very good. I hope we responded. We managed to reply to the comment. Unfortunately, it's an anonymous one. It says LinkedIn user, so I don't know the name of the person that uh, that uh, asked the question. In my experience in, in fashion law, uh, something that we needed to um, work on um, quite substantially on behalf of brands was uh, something which is quite basic when it comes to normal civil law so it was defects and late uh, late payments late deliveries um i remember quite important but also niche uh fashion brands in italy that had massive issues with their suppliers uh especially um when uh, fashion weeks uh came closer and closer essentially uh time is of the essence for the delivery mm. and the perfect performance of certain obligations in this case of manufacturing uh, of perfect products and these brands needed to display uh these new products these new collections uh prior to the fashion weeks so uh, sometimes it, it did happen that the suppliers in italy i'm not talking about suppliers at the other end of the world uh, Local, we had some, yeah. yeah it's uh it was something that would happen like 10 kilometers away from milan uh it happens it's it's business it's the risk of doing business it so happened that there were some some suppliers that, in, that had their own issues uh 
justifiable or not, but essentially they cause damages to my clients. And um, the interesting, there the were two, two things that, that, that struck me in terms of damages. One was that failing to meet the expectations of buyers um, on occasion of a fashion week could truly jeopardize the, um, the, the actual existence of a brand which is not solid enough because mm -hmm. you create expectations, buyers come, they don't see quality products, uh, you charge so much to consume, you as a brand, you charge so much to your consumers to, 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 for, for, for those items. And uh, when the products are defective or, or even worse, they're not even there, they will just cancel you. They will obliterate you. Number one. Yeah. Number two, so the damages caused by these suppliers were really bigger than simply saying, well, sorry, the products didn't arrive on time. They will arrive tomorrow. Sorry. Oops. Or we will fix whatever defects we had. And uh, secondly is actually the amount of the damages that some major fashion brands calculated on the retail price and not on the actual sum of money that they were charged by the supplier. So I'm just inventing the numbers here, but imagine you set a pair of uh, shoes for 500 pounds and the fashion brand pays, I'm just inventing a hundred pounds uh, to their suppliers for that. Uh, some designers had in their, uh, written agreements uh, with the with the suppliers a clause that said that in case of defects uh, or late deliveries when time was of the essence the damages would be in excess but in any case the base of the damages would be the cost the price tag uh, for consumers and not the actual price paid for by the by the brand so pair of shoes that costs uh, 100 pounds for the uh, brand sold at 500 pounds, um, the uh, fashion brand would demand 500 pounds from the uh, supplier that did not meet the requirements and did not perform its contractual obligations. Is it something that you have encountered in England too, Bumi? Um, so not personally within myself, but I know there's definitely examples, you know, of issues where you've had like defects, late deliveries. Um, if I take, for example, I remember, and this is even quite, you know, something that happened. But if I remember correctly, in 2017, um, I remember there was this thing of, you know, Zara had to do a big recall, for example. I think it was one of their children's items, um, their denim line. Um, and due to, you know, a high level of, um, you know, dye, um, which could have caused, you know, a lot of issues. They had to recall that back. I mean, yep. you know, the damage that that could have caused in itself, if we're looking at damages, that could have caused, you know, the brand's reputation, you know, customer trust, but also, you know, a long term to financial repercussions, like you've pointed out in terms of if we're lo just looking at it from a financial point of view, the amount of finances that have gone on to produce those garments, and then having to, for whatever reason, whether that's, you know, late delivery or defects, having to recall that back will definitely have a long term effect on them and the brand itself. Absolutely. I'm also thinking about um, indemnification or indemnity clauses. Uh, that is, sometimes you see these particularly uh, harsh uh, clauses that impose um, uh, indemnification in case of claims by third parties for violation of intellectual property rights. This is something that I see more in the cosmetics industry, which is an industry that I'm currently focusing on more. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I, I guess it is something that you would witness also in, in fashion law. That is, suppose you have a designer that, uh, you, you, again, you're a brand, you employ a fashion designer, the fashion designer designs the garment or, or whatever, and a third party in good faith would make a claim saying, wait a moment, that uh, garment is a copy or in any case infringes on my intellectual property rights. Mm. Um, in theory, uh, if you have a contract with, a, uh, with an indemnity clause, uh, uh, the, uh, the fashion brand would need to, to indemnify, um, or the, des the designer in this case, would need to indemnify the, uh, the brand for the uh, IPR violations. I don't know if this is something that you also witness in the in the fashion industry or also in the entertainment business, because this is something that also applies to that industry. Copyright yeah, I mean, time, time and time again, if I look at, you know, within the last two years, for example, where we've had so many cases of, you know, fashion brands putting out a piece of item and then you've got, you know, a third party, you know, whether big, for example, you know, coming back and saying, actually, that's something of their own. It's like, you know, what do you do in that case? Um, if I take, for example, you know, the ongoing case with Shein um, and mm -hmm. H&M, yeah. 
um, you know, the RICO case that she and are currently facing with, you know, independent designers who have all banded together and say, actually, she and are, you know, taking their designs. What mm. do you do in that case? You know, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah, uh, okay. That goes in the direction of what I was saying. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. So you mentioned you mentioned first of all that um, when you began your your journey in fashion law, um, you adopted a comparative approach uh, where with jurisdictions where fashion law um, was already more developed, like the US. Can you can you tell yeah. us more about your experience in 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 making these comparisons? And what you witness from the US, for instance, that uh, English lawyers or, or lawyers from jurisdictions where fashion law is not yet developed as much as in the US or in Italy for that matter, uh, can learn from. So I think for me, when I first started out, what struck me was how much in detail the US went really into, you know, protecting from beginning to the end in terms of, you know, when you're registering a trademark mm -hmm. compared to over here. For example, you know, in the UK, when you're registering the trademark, you would, you know, have to make sure that, you know, a trademark isn't already existing. So you would have to go to, I think it's the, the, the IPO register just to make sure, or even do like your own due diligence on Google just to see, is the name that I want to trademark already existing? That's the same thing within America. But what I realize is they have a lot more steps. For example, I think it is imperative for them in the US to actually have a legal representative be that at every begin in every stage of when they're registering. But over here in the UK, when you're doing it over the .gov website, you know, they do give you that option of whether to have everything done by a legal professional or if you just want to go, you know, by yourself and register it. And it kind of made me think in terms of that security within trademarks, for example, how mm -hmm. secure is registering a trademark in the UK compared to the UK? Oh, you know, absolutely. we do have legislation who, which is greatly, greatly strong within the UK. But in the US, I think for me personally, I just found it, it's a lot more stronger. It's a lot more stringent um, and a lot more stri uh, stricter um, as well. Do you think that that applies to uh, design as well uh, on top of trademarks? Because probably design is even more... I mean, no, trademark. I, I would say design is as relevant as trademarks in the fashion it industry. Is. Isn't it is. I think mm -hmm. design rights as well. And I think it's also good. I know like a lot of people don't realise, you know, there's two types of design rights, for example. So, you know, you've got the registered design rights. So, you know, that, uh, that actually provides, you know, a stronger protection and requires, you know, a formal registration with an intellectual property office. Um, and with registered design rights, you know, they're often used to protect, you know, aesthetic aspects of fashion items, such as you know handbags jewelry patterns or shoe designs then on the flip side you've got unregistered design rights so these provide i guess if you want to describe it as you know automatic you know it's time limited protection for you know a configuration of a design um the difference between i would say registered design rights and unregistered design rights is that unregistered design rights you know can be relevant in the fast paced world of fashion you know where things may change rapidly but i feel like they don't offer a lot more extensive protection as opposed to a registered design rights. So I feel like, you know, when people are trying to, you know, register a design right, they forget, you know, there are two types of design rights. So you've got to really think about what is it that you want from that registration. Very true. Very true. And then also enforcement uh, in that uh, with globalization, you, you still have to make a claim before a national body. So if you have a violation in country A, uh, but your trademark is not, or your design is not registered in country A, you will need to find some other ways to protect your your right, intellectual property rights. Exactly. Or even if you can make it to, uh, exactly. to go as yeah, even if you can make it to go as far as uh, receiving a favorable sentence, then you need to enforce it anyway. I mean, I see it here in Vietnam. Uh, 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 Vietnam is uh, a signatory of the um, New York Convention on the uh, enforcement, the recognition and enforcement of, of international arbitral awards. So if you go for arbitration, say in London, and then you want to enforce your arbitration award here in Vietnam, it is a lengthy, expensive and difficult process, but you can make it. But if you have a favorable sentence issued by a court of justice in any other country but Vietnam, good luck having it enforced here. So, uh, but it is. Very difficult. The, 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 the suggestion that I give to my clients when they operate in this part of the world is to try and go for the money directly where they where they uh, think the money can be, uh, in this case, exactly. Vietnam. 
exactly i mean i just want to add on to that because i have two examples one is a personal example um so myself and my friend we were doing business together um back i think in 2021 and we had registered um we had done our due diligence um you know on google and the register as well and found that you know no one wanted was using the name that we wanted to trademark so we went ahead made that trademark application um chose the classes that we wanted to trademark in you know paid for that application so everything was good then i think a couple of days after um we had some feedback because over here i'm not sure in other jurisdictions but in the uk um when you want to trademark a um uh, when you want to trademark and when you submit an application it does be it does it is made public within the register for i think about two months or so so anybody you know can oppose that application Absolutely. um depending you know if there are similarities or if there is a problem and then obviously if you don't hear back then you're all good to go but we actually within a week or so had some feedback and we found out that there was someone else actually based in france who had quite similar name that we wanted to trademark although ours was very different it wasn't the same but we had realized that the classes in which that we wanted to trademark are on were also similar to that brand over in France so we had a selection of options on what to do they gave us some options um and we just kind of it was like a process of elimination you know what can we do to resolve this issue so that it doesn't go to you know court for example so all we did was you know go back onto our application form and decide it all it needed to happen was you know take out some classes um that we had wanted to register our trademark in um and hopefully hope for the best that you know all was well and luckily enough when we did submit our application again they had no problems but i also like to use that as an example for people there sometimes you will encounter these problems when you're registering a trademark you know you might have done all your due diligence checked in the register if someone you know has a very similar name to you and it could be a little thing maybe you know it's your what you're looking to trademark is in the exact um, same class as another um, another brand as well um and the second example i actually came across was on tiktok um mm. so this brand they're a jewelry brand uh, based in the uk um and it was actually started up by a young girl at the age of i think she was 13 when she first started it so i think she's now currently 27 or in her late 20s basically um and it's a thriving jewelry business amazing sales and everything but unfortunately she had um some um hit back the name that she had trademarked under is exactly the same name as another brand um, overseas in Europe. Oh. I can't remember it. Yeah, <laughs> I can't remember the exact um, country, um, but she goes into a great deal about it in TikTok and she basically ex um, explains to her customers that because that brand has reached out and rightly so, it's a family household name. They've been around for years and years, way before her, that she has been actually forced to change her name. Um, and she just explained, you know, the situation in terms of the ongoing process, you know, having to change it on the website, company house, the website. Um, and I think it was a great educational moment, again, for people who were setting up businesses. And when you're looking to do that trademark application, it's so important to do your due diligence, because unfortunately, you don't want to get to that stage where you're already trading. And another business comes in and says, actually, you've got to cease trading because the name you're trading under exactly is my name, basically. So, I, yeah. I, I totally agree. I couldn't agree more, Bunmi. Uh, this is, so broadly speaking, not just in the fashion industry, but I think that one of the very first legal steps uh, that companies or individuals, entrepreneurs, need to take when starting a business is conducting a proper in-depth due diligence of intellectual property rights that they intend to use. Also because the times attached to applications can be considerably long. Uh, at least yeah. in this in this part of the world, it takes at least twelve months to have your trademark registered, and so many things can happen in those twelve months. So, if you're lucky and nobody claims uh, raises a claim or, or the authorities not raise an action against your application, then you start doing business, but you're you're protected, but with some limitations for a year, for a whole year of operations. And if things go sour, uh, then you, you might have to change the whole structure, the whole name, the whole labeling, etc. Uh, exactly. after you have invested so much. It actually happened to a client of mine in the fashion industry in Italy. Um, this, this lady used a, um, she actually used her family name as the fashion brand, which is also, which is 
kind of a tricky thing because you would think that not not you but one would think that uh using your family name could be protected de facto because i mean it's your it's family, your family name, name. <laughs> <laughs> but when your family name is quite popular uh and uh somebody else is trading in exactly the same industry and potentially also in the very same classes and you have not registered yours uh, so you didn't even know that there was an existing competitor that had registered the trademark then you're in big trouble in this specific case remember that it was very unfortunate she started a beautiful business uh, uh in using silk and cashmere which she went i remember that i went with her and her uh, business partners all the way to mongolia uh to scout for um suppliers of cashmere mongolian cashmere uh we had some incredible discussions over google translate with this cashmere, with the with the mongolian suppliers but that's beyond the topic um so she finally starts production uh she sought something from vietnam something from mongolia she studied the trademark so accurately she she set up the website and everything uh up to the point when she started saying she actually opened a shop a physical shop in milan uh with a sign uh, uh and uh and eventually a few weeks later she received a legal letter from the lawyer of a very famous lawyer um that defended the other brand and uh actually the, the that lawyer was absolutely right and this lady unfortunately was forced to change everything remove the sign remove every single label from every oh. single garment change the website change marketing strategy etc it was really really painful but i have to say i had told her <laughs> yeah <laughs> <I> think... uh, sorry <laughs> it's, it's one of those things and i really haven't you know obviously i didn't go to that great extreme length of having to you know change everything in the branding um but it is one of those things that i always like to tell people in terms of you really need to think about where you want your brand to be and what it is you don't want to make any rush decisions because what you don't want is you know to come up with a name register it start trading and then you get to a point especially if you're doing really really well in your business you get to yeah. a high point and then someone turns around and it's like actually hold on a minute you've got to really change everything up because we can't allow you to trade you know under our name um and it, that's why you know doing serious due diligence is so so important in the beginning yeah. stages so you know do your google research get onto the ipo register find out if there's any other brands that are you know have very similar names that you're looking to trade under and if they do kind of think about you know what are the classes that they're trading under because even stuff like that i think a lot of people also forget the classes that those trade names belong to are also contributing factors as well absolutely and on top of that uh to complicate things even further see also the jurisdiction that you intend to potentially uh do business yeah. in because you might register your trade in the uk but then uh one day you decide to do business in the us and whoops somebody else is already there Uh, yeah exactly and even more complicated um in countries that on top of latin letters use other alphabets uh so the typical case is china uh you uh you want to have your trademark protected in both latin letters as well as chinese characters um it it, it becomes quite complicated you need to have it translated properly it has to be meaningful in chinese it has it has first of all to have a meaning secondly it has to have a positive meaning because probably not probably but maybe the translation that you make of a, uh, a non chinese name into chinese could sound uh, not good uh, unlucky or 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 even or even insulting in in chinese and then you need to essentially follow a separate procedure uh, a parallel the separate procedure for the chinese uh, trademark um, so that it is protected as well so you might have to actually you have to lodge two separate applications one in latin characters and one in chinese characters i believe that that applies also to other countries where languages differ uh in yeah. terms of um in terms of alphabet i'm thinking about uh persia iran uh the arab world arab world and, yeah. and so and many african countries i'm thinking about ethiopia i'm thinking about what well, also other asian countries uh Thailand Laos uh, that that have their own scripts uh, let alone Hindi and and so on so it's it's really complicated if you if you think about it, it really is. yeah but speaking about global uh global matters um how do you see from your observatory um 
geopolitics and other mega trends impacting fashion law. I'm particularly thinking about, since, since I mentioned Vietnam and also the Indian subcontinent, um, Vietnam is a powerhouse for garments. Uh, here they, uh, they produce garments, uh, shoe wear, uh, leather wear for a multitude of countries. If you look at statistics from Italy, Italy sells a lot of raw materials. Then the Vietnamese work uh, on those raw materials and they ship them back to, uh, to Italy. Uh, I don't know how that makes sense cost-wise, especially after uh, logistics costs went up uh, due to the pandemic. And also it doesn't sound particularly friendly towards the environment. But um, in recent years, Vietnam lost ground against Bangladesh. Apparently, uh, I didn't study the matter in depth, in, in depth but uh, Bangladesh managed to um, get, or some producers in Bangladesh, better said, managed to get European green certifications that essentially give fast track and uh, a preferential treatment to them uh, against the Vietnamese manufacturers. So um, this is one thing, green certifications. Probably 10 years ago, nobody would have thought about it and the Vietnamese couldn't care. Uh, about such certification, they didn't even know that they, they probably didn't even know that they existed. They started manufacturing and oops, they rested on the laurels and here we are. And Bangladesh is taking over. And then uh, I mentioned environmental aspects. So uh, for instance, the fact that you ship raw materials from Europe to Asia and then back from Asia to Europe, which is not exactly yeah. environmentally friendly. You waste a lot of fuel, uh, for instance, and also a lot of time uh, and, and a lot of money. Uh, let alone uh, job losses in certain countries. Uh, that may sound a bit Trumpian from my side, but uh, um, with the reshoring <laughs> <laughs> of, of, of certain industries, um, certain specializations have been lost. When I, when I, actually, when I went with that client that I mentioned um, to Mongolia, we saw some machinery that came from Italy and that the Mongolians were not really... Um, really friendly with in that they, they, they were not familiar with, sorry, I used the wrong term, they were not familiar with, in that those machineries needed to be operated by workers that really needed to know where to place their hands. And, um, and um, the Mongolian workers, as, as hardworking as they were, didn't have the expertise. They were not exposed to the old uh, Italian workers that knew that. And that skill eventually got lost because the Italian workers are probably already dead or retired. The Mongolians have not been exposed to that experience. And even if you reshore that, that type of manufacturing, you will probably not revive those techniques. And then again, um, supply chains, uh, disruptions uh, due to pandemics, due to what is happening in the trade wars with China, um, import duties and so on. So all these things combined, all these things together, where do you see fashion law going? I see within, I would say, the last couple of, let's say, five, three years, we've had a lot going on in the world. So we've had, for us over here in the UK, we've had, you know, the Brexit. Absolutely. You know, we finally finalised on that. We've had, you know, the effects of the pandemic, where that completely shifted the fashion industry and where it is now. You know, with the loss of jobs, um, we've had, you know, the ongoing war with U Ukraine and Russia, for example, and, the, you know, the sanctions regimes and everything like that. So and now even now we've got the rise of AI, you know, technology mm -hmm. is taking over the fashion industry, the society as a whole, to be quite frankly honest with you, but definitely within the fashion industry. So there is a lot going on within the world that is really making the fashion industry, I guess, somewhat difficult to lead on. Um, there are a lot of legal implications from that. But I would even say, for example, you know, just when we're talking about the supply chain disruptions, you know, you've got the geopolitical uh, tensions, the trade disputes um, and the economic sanctions between different countries, like I said, you know, that can disrupt the global supply, you know, for textiles, clothing. Um, and because of this, manufacturers heavily rely on, you know, importing materials from different countries, whether that's cotton, satin. Um, and everything like that. And with what's going on in society at the moment, we've obviously had a lot of delays and increased costs. You know, again, it doesn't help that we're having this ongoing war between Ukraine and Russia. We've had Brexit. Everything, it's kind of like I feel like the fashion industry is literally fighting to stay up on top. There's <laughs> always something. And it's kind of like, when is the industry going to have a break? Do you get what I mean? Like, when is everything going to be, a, you know, a, a sort of 
level playing playing field that they can completely breathe. I see. I see what you mean. I see it a lot in the cosmetics industry where there used to be and still is a vast use of plastic materials. Uh, and obviously with the new pieces of legislation banning plastic uh, altogether, that is, that is an issue. Think about all the um, packaging manufacturers that make packs, containers in plastic. Uh, I, I guess that that applies also to the, uh, to the, to the fashion industry. So um, yeah, yeah, I totally see uh, what you mean. I think it's a, it's a cross, um, it's a cross industry uh, set of problems. It's not only one, but I, I see, I can see how the fashion industry is affected and how that has massive legal implications that we lawyers need to keep abreast of because we, we are sometimes not even uh, up to date ourselves with, uh, with new norms and such implications. Exactly. Exactly. I, I was even going to say, I think the fashion industry, if we're looking at it from a legal point of view, I think in terms of the issues that are having, I guess from a legal point of view for legal professionals and lawyers, there is obviously an abundance of work that we will mm. you know, definitely be able to sink our teeth into because there is just so many issues, so many problems that one will have to combat. And I don't think looking at the issues that we're currently facing in the fashion industry, I don't think it's something that can be sorted overnight. It's going to be something, you know, if we're looking at the environment, we're currently going through, you know, global warming and how we can make, you know, our emissions a bit lower and, you know, finding out different ways that we can, you know, do fashion, for example. So, you know, fast fashion, not engaging in fast fashion, you know, rewearing clothes, reselling clothes, for example. So it's, I don't think we have one particular answer at the moment. I think there's just so much scope for us, you know, to be working at. Totally. I, I, I'm, I've always been intrigued by technology and this is an area of practice uh, of mine, of my firm. And uh, I find um, the use of new materials quite fascinating um, and, and also quite interesting also for environmental causes. Um, apparently there, there have been some developments in the production of garments that essentially to, to oversimplify, they keep you cool when it's warm outside and they mm. keep you warm when it's cold outside. But you touched on artificial intelligence and I was wondering whether you had uh, some more to say about uh, the role of AI and, and fashion because this could be quite fascinating. Yeah, with AI, I mean, you know, we're no strangers to it. It has taken, I think, within the last two years or so, the world by storm. Um, mm -hmm. We have, it, and I think when we're talking about AI, I know there's sometimes, a lot of the time, there's a negative connotation to it. Um, and there is the scare factor in terms of it's looking to replace human beings, replace jobs. Um, but I also think we should look at it from a point of view in terms of how it could help us assist in oh, yes. our jobs, for example. So I know in terms of, you know, AI, I think it was back in March, April or so, um, for example, uh, Levi's, so the jeans manufacturers, the brand, mm. they were looking to test out AI generative uh, models um, in a mm. bid to, I guess, solve the issue of diversity within model mm. Um, You know, obviously, you know, in terms of the modeling world, which is a part of the fashion industry and is in itself a whole different world and a different entity. You know, there is this ongoing thing with diversity in the fashion industry within, yes. within models, you know, We've got, you know, access, you know, people who are disabled accessing the modeling world. We've got, you know, casting issues between, you know, there being a fair playing field between, you know, black models being casted, Asian models being casted, the type of work and all of that stuff. So it's even big. Um, but what Levi have decided to do in a bid to combat the diversity issue is to generate um, IA models, you know, <laughs> in the hopes of, solving the um issue do i think it will work um no <laughs> no okay okay that's interesting yeah okay. I, personally for me i look at it as like i i see where they're heading and i see what they're trying to do but okay. isn't it not a case of putting people out of jobs the models themselves right Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yes, no. absolutely. No, I was yeah. thinking that perhaps it is not exactly a brand that has, uh, that is particularly involved in fashion shows. Uh, it's not really a uh, uh, haute couture brand that needs models going on a no, a not going in the catwalk. So, yeah. Yeah. So as long as you represent diversity, so if, if the focus is diversity and you represent diversity through AI instead of real models, 
you have addressed the topic. But on the other hand, it's true. You're not actually employing those people. Uh, you're, you're using computer-generated images that replace you know, all yeah. models altogether, including the ones that legitimately are already represented. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, get, I, I, get, I get your point. It's trying uh, to solve a problem, but then you're creating another problem in itself through, you know, employability and... What about what about creativity? That is um, a very hot topic at the moment in Hollywood is that of screenplay writers uh, that are on strike uh, mm. because artificial. So it relates probably to the uh, uh, environment, to the um, entertainment parts of your yeah. your practice. But um, they are on strike, and in any case, they are they are uh, demonstrating because major um, film producing houses are using databases of old scripts to produce new scripts, new screenplays. Um, and essentially they say, well, wait a moment, this is a total violation of our, of our creativity, of our intellectual property rights. Property, yeah. uh, but because what we call AI is actually machine learning to be more, more accurate with the definition. So mm -hmm. a machine learns from the past. And in this case, the past is represented by the old scripts. Uh, that have been used, and they are public, okay? So the, the legal uh, nuance here is that all these uh, playwrights, are, 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 all these screenplays are, are out. They're public. They're of public domain. You can, you can Google them. You can read them yourselves. You can, it, it's like buying books or reading books. You go to a library, you read a number of books, and then so, an idea pops in your mind and you write a new book. Except that instead of you, individual person, uh, having this idea and getting paid for it, hopefully, it will be the computer, it will be the machine that after learning from so many scripts uh, will generate a new exciting film, <laughs> essentially. Not the film, but the screenplay for, mm -hmm. for the film, the dialogues and everything. Yeah. And they are protesting against that. I, and I think rightly so, uh, because they are demanding proper regulations of artificial intelligence in the US, contrary to what happened with giant, uh, with, with now giant players in the internet industry. Uh, especially sh social networks, where well, there was a debate uh, 10, 20 years ago on how and if to regulate them, if at all. Um, think about Facebook and whether the debate on whether it should be regulated as a news uh, outlet, uh, and the answer was evidently no, and look at the consequences of that now uh, on society. And uh, so they're saying, well, let's not make the same mistake again with artificial intelligence. Is this something that you're seeing in the fashion industry on top of the entertainment business when it comes to, for instance, the creation of new models? Models, not the people, but the garments. Yeah, there is a lot of issues. I mean, we have seen successfully AI being used in catwalks. So I think it's hmm. uh, the Dior fashion walks, Burberry. Um, I remember back in lockdown, for example, using 3D models. I think the brand, I think it was Hanifa. So they're an American brand. And she decided to use 3D models to, you know, demonstrate her new collection. And that, I remember that took the world by storm. Obviously, you know, this has happened in the past, but the way in which she did it was, you know, very innovative. It was this new phenomenon that people mm -hmm. wanted to adopt. And I think it really shaped how we do catwalks, how we do fashion shows as well. Um, the issue that may arrive with that, and you touched upon it, is intellectual property. Yep. Who owns the IP with AI? <laughs> exactly. That, exactly. That, who owns it? In a, in a space where it's not very regulated, as far as you know how other um, industry, other sectors within the fashion industry is regulated. We're still working on regulating AI within the you know different spaces, but especially within uh, fashion. I see an analogy with what happens with inventions in a company. So uh, you have an engineer that develops something new, a pattern typically, within a company. It will be the company that employs this engineer that will own the intellectual property rights and will exploit them and not the engineer uh, in person. But, uh, of course, there will be some monetary recognition uh, on top of moral rights uh, given to the engineer that uh, developed the new solution, whatever. Yeah. Speaking about intellectual property rights, I see a question from the audience, from Amanda Forzani, that asks, can you share some insights on how intellectual property rights play a role in protecting creative designs within the fashion world? This is a bit broad, but... 
we can start the, the oh, Q&A session here because we have about 10 minutes left. So we can start with this and then see if the other questions pop up. Um, so it is a very broad question because to be honest with you, the intellectual property plays a massive role. I feel like all that we've it's been not... talking to is yeah. with intellectual property and you can see just how big the role it plays. Um, but I think to sum up, I think the role of intellectual property is at the heart of it is to protect your brand. You know, it's there to protect your brand, your business and what you've worked for. Um, it's there to safeguard, you know, your brand, but also your reputation. So I would say in the first instance, if you're looking at, you know, what type, what what role does it play? I would say it plays a legal protection. You know, by trademarking your business name, you gain that legal protection and exclusive rights to use your name in the industry or market that you're working in. So nobody can come up to you and say, oh, um, you know, you're using xyz can i please use that you've already registered it and that belongs to you so if you find out that someone's you know using your trademark in whatever industry you have all rights and you know all purposes and rights to legally take action and you know try and get them to stop taking it so in that sense you've got an upper hand in terms of when you trademark your business name um, I would also say for brand recognition, you know, in the examples that we spoke about between, you know, the jewellery maker, but also your client. And it was that thing of brand, branding. Branding is yep. so important when you're starting out um, in all industries, but also especially within the fashion industry, because that's what people are going to associate yourself with. And I remember you spoke about, you know, your client having to go back and basically change over their whole branding you know, they had got their website, they had set up an in-person shop and everything. And now that someone had come to them and basically challenged them, they had to change that up. So I would say definitely, again, brand recognition, you know, trademarking your business name ensures that, you know, your brand stands out and it's easily, um, easily recognized among your competitors in the industry that you're working in. Um, I would also say, again, in terms of preventing long um, legal disputes I think this hangs on to again that branding your own branding what is your branding you know again doing due diligence you need to do due diligence I don't know how much I'm going to have to stress this because I think when you do your due diligence in the beginning stages it can really save just the amount of work that you're going to have to do in the later stages. And I also say this to people, especially within the UK. So our trademarks last, I think, 10 years, basically. So every 10, 10, 10, every 10, 10 years, you're going to have to, you know, re-register them again. What you need to be thinking about, is not just your branding now, but your branding in the future, in the long run. Where do you see your business taking off? You know, where do, you don't just see in, you know, in a particular class, but try and think ahead, where do you think it is? And that will save you time as well. Because what you don't want to do with, you know, trademarking your brand names is it brings long-term value to your company. It also, you know, if you're looking at in the future, trying to, you know, sell your shares within your brand, your business, you want to look at, you know, your market worth, how, how big is your market worth in that business? How attractive it is to potential buyers or investors and partners? So I would say just generally, it is a very broad aspect in terms of the role it plays, but definitely in terms of, you know, the long-term value, preventing legal um, disputes and that legal protection, it really holds key. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more, Bunmi. Thank you. I do not see other questions from the audience. So... Bunmi, do you have any other remarks, any other insights that you want to give to uh, our audience, just in case? Um, I would say fashion law. Um, I started this journey back in 2016. It's now 2023 and a lot has changed, um, hmm. as with society as a whole. But the landscape of fashion law in itself has changed. The way in which we interact with consumers um, the way fashion designers interact, um, the way us as, you know, legal professionals, lawyers interact with those in the fashion industry has changed a lot. It's an ever changing industry um, and it's an exciting industry to work in as well. Um, and I also say to people, if you're looking to start in fashion law, um, especially if you're in a place like the UK where there isn't a lot of resource resources out there as compared to the US, you want to make sure, you know, you're really commercially aware. So making sure that you know what's going on in the business, what's going on in the industry, getting yourself clued up or, you know, the legalities, the language, the jargon 
um, the issues that are within the fashion industry. Um, I think somebody asked, you know, could you share some references um, on how you can deep more into the topic? I would say definitely look into online resources such as the Fashion Law. Um, it's an amazing resource. Um, they upload daily lots of blog posts on things that are happening currently within the fashion industry, a, a lot of fashion cases as well. The business of fashion is, again, an amazing resource for people to, you know, just to look up and to see what's going on from a business business point of view as well. Um, I would also say um, my website, for example, what I'm currently using. So although I'm now turning it into a legal and business consultancy, um, we definitely still uh, hold, you know, in-person and virtual events. And it's about, you know, merging legal professionals with those in the fashion industry. That's my key takeaway and that's what I want to share with people um, to be able to make law creative affordable and relevant for all. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you, Bunmi. Let's remember let's remind the audience again of the uh, website so that they can reach you. Yep. So it's at www.thelawoffe.com. Um, we're also um, on Instagram as the law of FE, on LinkedIn as the law of FE, and also on Twitter as the law of FE as well. Brilliant. I had a wonderful chat with you, Bunmi. Thank you so much. I've learned a lot and I'm sure that our audience appreciated it too. Uh, I look forward to uh, uh, future discussions and perhaps doing some stuff together. Uh, uh, name of the website again, please. So, um, is, uh, it if you can is it possible that I can type it into the chat? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm just trying to find like a chat button. There is the private chat. Uh, I would ask Amir in the background if he can... Uh, post the name of your website again yeah if you can do it yeah um i will send the website um yes. as well so that people can you know get clued up on that as well um so uh, adobe um you will see uh, it somebody from uh, from the audience you will see it uh on linkedin i believe it will be posted there don't worry so it is the law of fe uh, that's the law of f f e dot com or the law of of uh, the law of f f e dot com again Moonbi, uh, Moonbi and everyone at Liga Mart, thank you very much for today's session it was great and uh, have a lovely evening or day ahead thank you thank you so much bye 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 thank you